to a Millie event for the first time, let me introduce what our company stands for and what we do. Millie is a company dedicated to building a community for international uh, school students globally. And as a former international school student myself, I really wish that I had a space like Millie's for guidance when I was going through all the motions of higher education. Millie hosts webinars and panels like this almost every weekend. In fact, later today, after this one, we're hosting Millie's Guide to Art School, US versus UK. And next week, we're hosting Millie's Guide to Student Entrepreneurship and our Guide to Early Applications. So there's really something for everyone. Feel free to invite your friends and family and anyone who might be interested. And if you want to keep up to date with what we have to offer, please be sure to check out our website at milliegroup.com and follow our other social media links for more updates. And before I hand it over to our awesome panelists, a little bit on the structure of the panel. We have some pre-prepared questions, but again, you can always feel free to submit your own questions um, through the Q&A function in our chat. And for the first 45 minutes or so, we'll go through those questions that were prepared. And after that, we'll let our panelists answer any questions you might have. So you can have the general questions or um, you can direct it for a specific panelist, either is fine. Okay, so let's get started. Um, let's start with like a 20 to 30 second intro for each panelist. So Cherry, can you start with telling us your name, the city you're currently in or from and uh, one little fact about yourself? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Cherry and I'm currently in Hong Kong studying in the University of Hong Kong, the Cushing Faculty of Medicine. And um, I think one fun fact about myself is that I'm currently on my uh, enrichment year, so it's sort of like my gap year. So I'm just doing fun things like researching, I'm cooking a bit more, drawing a bit more. And yeah, I think that's my fun fact. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kyle. Um, like the University of Hong Kong studying medicine, um, a fun fact about me is that um, I like to play a sport called Ultimate Frisbee. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows about this sport in Hong Kong, but so I think that's a fun fact about me. So hi everyone, I'm Alina. So I'm in London studying medicine at UCL. And one fun fact about me is that I'm pitch perfect. So yeah. Wow, pitch perfect, that's so cool. So uh, I'm sure that must get annoying sometimes if you pull it out at a party. <laughs> so, um, Cherry, in as little words as possible, like maybe just a sentence, what is it exactly that you do? During my research, you mean, or my enrichment year? Oh, actually, I'm doing um, a research studying the role of a type of hormone in the role of um, ischemic strokes, ischemia reperfusion injury. So it sounds quite complicated, but it's quite fun. We're just doing some um, lab work and um, we're handling rats and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it's a lot cooler than it sounds. Um, so, unlike Cherry, I'm not in my third year yet, so I'm still in my second year. Um, in, in second year, second year is still considered as a preclinical year in HKU Med. So this year, we're, we're still going through the human body. Uh, we're going through different systems, for example, the musculoskeletal system uh, or the endocrine system and so forth. So after we get through this year, we will be proceeding to the enrichment year that Cherry is talking about. And it's sort of like a gap year where we get to experience different things um, based on our own interests. So I think I'm the oldest because I'm in fifth year. So I'm in my fifth year out of a six, six year course. So this is my second year um, actually in the hospital, like on the wards, like learning from like real life patients, taking histories, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, just like Hong Kong U, for us, our third year is like an enrichment year where you like kind of branch off and do your own research and you get like a bachelor's at the end of that. And then years four, five, six of clinical medicine and years one and two, just like Kyle, um, it's like preclinical medicine where you just learn about like biochemistry and like the human body. Great. Um, I, I wanted to touch on this as part of our intro because I feel like it'd be a bit silly not to mention how COVID affected everybody. So for Cherry and, and Alina, we'll disrupt, the, we'll disrupt the sequence for a second here. You guys started med school pre-COVID, correct? So I would like to know what was your normal schedule like and how did it change during the peak of COVID? And, and now that the world is basically opening back up in, in most, in, I mean, maybe, maybe not everywhere, but in, in a lot of places, uh, what changes have there been since then, if any? And Kyle, uh, I just want you to answer if, uh, 
how your plans have been affected by COVID and then how is everything going now? Um, do I start off? Okay, okay, yeah. So um, at the start, uh, like pre-COVID, uh, we had to attend uh, in-person lectures. We got to do dissections in person and all of those things. But once COVID hit, I think our school was also navigating how to uh, properly run distance learning. So uh, everything got transformed onto Zoom. All of our lectures were through Zoom. Um, we couldn't do dissections as much. So I think there's good things and bad things about this because if your education is like um, from Zoom, you can watch these videos at your own pace again. So that's that's a good thing. But in terms of your mental health, the social aspect of medical school, then um, we did miss out quite a bit. So that could have been quite like grueling for some of the people that could have experienced the social life before COVID and then like the effects afterwards. But yeah, that's all I have to say for this bit. Oh, Alina, if you could go after Cherry. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I did all my preclinical stuff before COVID. So for me, it was kind of a lot of like nine to five timetable lectures and then like lab time, actual like dissections on like a cadaver, like a whole cadaver for us to dissect. So that was pretty cool. And then, so COVID like actually probably hit when I was in, in my en enrichment year. So everything like um, I had to stop my dissertation early because I couldn't go into the lab and all my, my lectures were online and even in fourth year. So that was when COVID was starting to die down a bit in the UK. So we were allowed back on the wards, but like it was it was very much like re a reduced timetable to compare to what it was beforehand. So we'd probably spend like one week on the wards and one week just at home, like learning things on Zoom. Um, so yeah, kind of like, as, like Cherry said, like it's it has like impacted our like social life but because like I didn't really have COVID during like freshers or second year like I'd already made like a lot of friends so it didn't really affect me as much as it would have probably affected someone who's in like first year second year third year now. Yeah so um, my experience with COVID was a bit different so I started medical school when the COVID pandemic was at its largest so for example we didn't even get to get our white coat ceremony um, but we did have most of our classes on Zoom apart from certain practicals like the dissection labs. So we still had that face-to-face. -face. And these practicals were the main way for us to interact with each other um, physically. Um, in terms of how COVID affected me personally, um, I think it did not really affect me that much because Zoom or online lectures were actually quite nice in a sense that we get to pace out everything ourselves and um, get to uh, figure out our own schedule. Um, the hugest impact on me would probably be um, my plan on doing overseas service. So I was going to try to go to Nepal to do a um, service trip um, in December, but um, due to COVID, we weren't like able to go overseas to do uh, any sort of medical services. So um, that was sort of the biggest impact on me. Wow, I mean, it impacted everybody so differently, but at the same time, it's interesting because you guys are on, on the same track. Okay, um, we're gonna jump into like a study, the study portion of everything now. Cherry, what has your med school journey been like so far? So if you could give us an overview of steps from high school to where you are now. Okay, sure. I think for me, I started to think about wanting to study medicine in about year 12, year 13. Um, and I started to talk to some of my seniors about it. And they recommended a, a, a few books for me to read first to see if I'm interested in medicine. And they've also, uh, some of my seniors also asked me to maybe try to um, get some clinical experience. So reach out to certain doctors and professors and try to email them to see if you can do a sort of clinical attachment, a surgical attachment. And that's what I did. And I attached to the Department of Neurosurgery at um, a local hospital. And I, I think I just sort of fell in love with medicine at that moment. And um, and I know that it might be a bit daunting, like to have to, cause like to get into medical school, there's this whole um, expectation on you to get your grades perfect. But um, you just like, from that moment onwards, I just had to start planning, like maybe start going to tutoring, start trying to fill up some things on my CV, read more books um, to do with medicine. I know this might sound really generic and you guys might roll your eyes, but like the book that I read was uh, When Breath, when Breath Becomes Air by uh, Paul Kalanithi, like that book, like I thought I found it really good and it was very inspiring. So um, like I just stuck onto my goal and then like um, I'm really thankful to be where I am now. So yeah, I think that's my journey so far. I think I could go next. So um, 
I did the IB curriculum. So um, it's the international bachelorette program. Um, so um, during the program, we had this activity called CAS. So we had to do a service. Um, for that service, my school organized a trip to Laos. So it's No, it looks like we lost him. Okay, let's give it a second. I hope... Kyle, come back. <laughs> um, Cherry, is that book like a like secret code for med students? I feel like everybody kind of giggled a little bit when you said that. <laughs> it's this book. Oh no, the background's making it. Yeah, but um, it's it's, it's this too book too. that's quite. <laughs> yeah, this book's quite like um universal for like um being mentioned in a lot of cvs and like uh, not not cvs i mean personal statements and stuff like that like um so it's a bit generic but it is actually a very good book anyway like kyle's back so i'll pass it back to him okay kyle you you cut off right at your cas um project so if you want to jump back in <laughs> okay okay sorry my bad so yeah um uh for our cas we actually went to uh lao so it's a third world country in asia so from that experience, I got to experience like the really huge healthcare difference between uh, metropolitans like Hong Kong and um, rather uh, poor countries. So um, this experience allowed me to dive deeper um, into the sort of differences between how um, people get to experience um, healthcare in general. Um, so that really touched me and I really want to give back to um, societies that are often neglected in, in the field of healthcare. And so that was one big reason why um, I, I joined um, the medical faculty um, of HKU. Um, in terms of my studies um, back then, it was mainly just trying to get my grades up as Kerry mentioned. So that's probably the most important thing to get into medical school. But at the same time, I was able to do a lot of other stuff. For example, I still played sports like table tennis and I swam. So I think a good balance of academics and um, um, extracurriculars is like the best way to do if you're still in high school at the moment. So I've kind of always wanted to like, be a doctor ever since I was a kid because um, like I really like science and I really like kind of helping people, making them feel better, potentially hopefully like, getting them physically better. So for me, like medicine was like the natural choice. Um, so I did um, A-levels in the UK. So like GCC A-level, that system. Um, so I started like looking into work experience kind of like summer before year 11, which is quite early. I should have started like summer after my GCSEs, but I just did it a year early for no reason whatsoever um and then so I did some like short-term work experience just to like actually understand what it's like to work in a hospital like it's not like Grey's Anatomy guys sorry to disappoint um, um and then I did like long-term like long-term volunteering so I did like um I volunteered with like an, an elderly people's charity I don't know if that's what you call it but yeah I went and volunteered to help like elderly people for a year to just kind of show that like you can work with like, vulnerable people and you can actually commit to something because medicine is a very long course and you need to be able to show that you can commit to something long term and then kind of in terms of exams um so this is slightly different to Hong Kong I think because in the UK you need to do two exams to get into medical school one's the UK CAT and the other one's the BMAT so some universities so UCL needed the BMAT other universities like I think Manchester and like a lot of the universities like in England require the UK cap. So I did those two before I actually do my A-level exams in year 13. So it was like those three exams. And then you kind of, your grades don't need to be super, super like high to get into medical school in the UK. So you, it, you don't need like three A stars or whatever or something crazy like that to get into medical school, but like just like check what each university needs. And then, yeah, on top of that, I did like extracurricular activities to kind of like keep me sane. And yeah, that's how I got to this point. Wow, so you faced a lot of really like maybe high pressure examinations early on in your academic career. But I'm glad to just hear that you stay sane. Um, Cherry, what is your favorite and your least favorite thing about studying medicine? I think the first thing about studying medicine, like medicine is such a unique um, area of knowledge because it's not only integrating science and it's also integrating science with humanities so I think that's that's an aspect that I really enjoyed because both science and humanities were two subjects that I liked the most 
Um, and I also realized like studying medicine, like everything that you learn, you will be able to put to work one day and to be able to help people. So I think that's really, really meaningful. Um, and, and it's just, it's very interesting. If it's, if you're truly studying something that you love, sometimes it doesn't really feel like work. It, it feels like, it feels like, um, it feels like a hobby, but then again, uh, medicine is probably um, one of the most rigorous programs um, and it can get in the way of your mental health. Sometimes when you're nearing your exams, it's quite easy to lose balance of your life and um, just sort of uh, neglect your mental health. So I think that would be probably my least favorite part of medicine, that sometimes it doesn't leave you enough time to just slow down and enjoy life. But other than that, I think medicine is very worth it. And um, I think um, there's also something like, um, there's a lot of different specialties in medicine, but I think there will be something for everyone. Like, I think um, that's also quite a unique point about medicine, but yeah. Um, so what I like about medicine is really about the hands-on um, aspect of things. So unlike other subjects, for example, if you're doing um, pure sciences, you get to maybe do a lot of labs, but um, with medicine, you, uh, the hands-on stuff extend beyond lab work. So you get to um, interact with patients, you actually get to um, use different sort of instruments to um, advance um, healthcare in general. So I really like this hands-on aspect of things. Um, and this is probably the thing that I enjoy most about medicine. And what I probably the least favorite thing about medicine for me is similar to Cherry, um, because the workload is indeed huge. Um, especially um, if you study uh, medicine at HKU, um, due to the fact that we have the enrichment year, they tend to um, put all of the clinical preclinical um, materials into two years. So you're expected to study a lot, a lot of stuff within the first two years. So for me, this is probably the part that um, I like the least. So kind of what I like most about medicine and like this has become really, really apparent since like I've started clinical medicine is that like what you learn like at home or like in a lecture or whatever you actually use to treat patients. And like, so you maybe you'll learn like the symptoms and whatever, whatever disease and you go and talk to a patient and then it is actually like what they're experiencing. And it's just like you have some idea of like how you can make them better. And it's like, you're actually like physically helping people. Or like if you, when you learn to kind of take bloods and like do observations, you're actually directly contributing to the care of a patient. I think that's really, really meaningful. But um, one thing like I really, really didn't like about medical school um, is like the workload, especially like in like the preclinical years, cause it feels like you're learning a lot of biochemistry and it's like, you're not really sure what, why you're doing it. Cause, um, especially if you're learning something like anatomy, like you're learning like the nerve supply to this really, really obscure organ that you're just never going to need to know ever, but you just need it for your exams. Otherwise you're going to fail. It's like a lot of people that I know and me, especially, I was kind of like saying that going, why am I learning all this? Like, how is this relevant to me as a doctor? And I found that like kind of really difficult to get my head around, but yeah, it, it's a lot better now. That's good. I mean, I'm glad to hear that. I thought that it was just me sitting in business school learning astronomy for no reason and feeling so confused. But I'm glad to see that med, med, med students have to struggle with this too. Um, Cherry, were there any parts of med school that you didn't anticipate or expect going into it? And like something that surprised you? Um, I think there are two things, but I'll just talk about the main one first. Like I didn't expect that I would be able to have as much of a social life as I do now because I had this whole stereotype of med students just staying in the library 24 seven even though that's kind of true like towards the later terms but actually at the start of the year there's a lot of there's a lot of different things you can join a lot of different societies like at, at uh, Kyle and my school like where we would go to the same school there's there's a pediatric society there's um there's some academic societies there's some neuroscience societies and I joined one which is for international exchange. It's called it's called AMSA, Asian Medical Students Association um, of Hong Kong, and um, we got to go to India. Well, this is pre-COVID, but we 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 were lucky enough to go to India for pre-COVID, and we got to visit hospitals there and stuff like that. Like I never I never expected to be, and also I got to make a lot of friends just in the society. And like I didn't expect to 
get that uh, be able to get that sort of social aspect in medical school. And there's also a lot of sports teams, a lot of clubs. Like the social aspect is actually not as bad as some people might think. It's it's actually pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, yes, I actually do agree with Cherry on this point. So. Um, before I got into medical school, like everyone told me it's going to be a really, really cutthroat program. Um, you'll spend most of your time studying. But um, when you get into the program, you realize that the people around you are actually already supportive of you. Um, as Sherry said, there will be a lot of opportunities for you to meet people, like-minded people, in fact. So um, you always get together um, to discuss things, to talk about things. Um, to get through medical school together in general. So it's not like uh, it's not like you going into a system to endure everything on your own. Um, and which is what I actually expected in, at the beginning. Um, so the experience of talking to people, socializing with people to get through the curriculum um, together is something that I actually expected the least. but um, I'm also really glad that um, I have this support system in the medical school. Yeah, so similar to kind of Kyle and Cherry, I wasn't really expecting the people to be like nice, especially people like the older years, because like I always thought that like, if you went to medical school before like backstabbing, backstabbing snakes, and there are backstabbing snakes in any course of any uni, but then like there are also like loads and loads and loads of people like in like the older years or my years who always be like, oh, do you want my notes? Or like, oh, I found this really, really good resource. You should like have a look at it. It's really, really good. Or like, oh, um, here's some like past questions from like past years. Have a look at them in your own time. Like I didn't expect people to be that helpful. So yeah, that was that was a good thing. Um, Cherry, there are so many different types of areas in medicine to study that and you can specialize in. So how can you how did you choose? Well, actually, like for HKU, we I think we choose after we graduate, but uh, many people will already have in mind if they want to do internal medicine or surgery. Um, I'm, I find it quite hard to decide this. I, I know I'm interested in surgery, but uh, I just don't know which subject or, or which sort of branch. So I think a good tip that I've been told by seniors is to do more research if you can, do some research, maybe do some clinical attachments. These will help you be able to um, sort of uh, be able to decide because with each specialty, there's a very different work culture. It's a different type of thing for each one like maybe for neurosurgery there might be more microsurgical skills for um for for maybe gastroenterology or something else it's it's a different type of surgery it also depends on what type of person you are maybe you like i'd advise people who are interested to attend maybe some certain uh surgical career talks like certain schools have that quite a quite a lot like uh hku does that sometimes and it's quite helpful so um i think that's it maybe just do some research and also like uh like just email professors and ask if you can join their uh, researches and some are nice enough to take you in and also um, surgical attachments at hospitals. Right. Um, uh, since I'm still in my uh, second year, um, I haven't even gone through half of the human body. So it's really hard for me to um, make a decision on what I'm interested in. Um, but I have heard from my seniors that um, the way that they make their final decision is that they try to join as many clinical attachments as possible. So um, they would do this uh, by the process of elimination. So for example, they would go to attach at a neurosurgery um, um, uh, a department for one summer and a cardiothoracic uh, department or something like that in another summer. So um, they would go to all these kinds of different attachments and figure out which ones they really did not like. So they would cross it off their list. And then, so at the end of the day, by year six, which is the final year, they would have a grasp of um, which um, few departments or specialties that they could um, choose from. And so that sort of um, minimizes the pool they have to choose from to make the whole process easier for them. But once again, this is not from my personal experience, so I'm just speaking from what I've heard of, yeah. So um, from my experience like in the UK, a lot of people don't actually decide on what they want to specialize in until they've graduated and they've done like two or three years of, as a doctor. So um, whatever like kind of you go into medical school wanting to do, you will probably leave with like, even if you haven't changed your mind, you'll have like a change of perspective on what it's like, because 
I don't think like I fully understood what it was like to like actually be attached to specialty and I like, do like rotate in that specialty until I started clinical medicine so like work experience didn't prepare me for that preclinical medicine didn't prepare me for that so what I say what I would kind of recommend is like when you're actually attached to that specialty in like your clinical years like actually pay attention to what they're doing and think about like if that's something that you can see yourself doing for the rest of your life because so I went into medical school wanting to be like a medical oncologist and now I don't want to do that anymore <laughs> so yeah it changes a lot for like a lot of people so I just say I like, just keep an open mind like throughout medical school like you're not going to decide on what you want to do even potentially towards the end but like it's a process so you will get there that's that's so cool so 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 do you guys also have like a list of stuff that you're just like crossing off also as you're as you're going through everything <laughs> um okay so as I'm gathering I think that maybe that was a a more ambiguous question so let's try let's try this instead cherry how did you choose which university to attend um okay so the first thing i try to narrow down is the location like i always knew i wanted to stay in hong kong because all my family's here so uh in hong kong there are two medical schools like for um uh, for anyone who's interested in applying to the hong kong medical schools and they're actually quite different although like all the all the curriculum like all the knowledge covered is pretty much the same i think uh, that can be said for like a lot of medical schools, but it's the structure that's completely different. Uh, for see, so for the Chinese University of Hong Kong, so this is not the one that Cal and I go to. Um, there isn't an enrichment year. We don't get to have one year, one year of a break to just explore what we want. But uh, in in the University of Hong Kong, we get to do that. That's our third year, so we can choose between service, we can choose between research, we can choose between doing a master's or even a even a um, even. Uh, I think a bachelor's or something like that and I kind of enjoy that sort of freedom so I chose uh, HKU well I applied to both but eventually chose HKU so um, yeah it's also a lot about um, the culture there so maybe you can talk to some students that already study at the medical school that you're, you're interested to I find that a lot of them are actually very friendly and willing to to share notes like like as Alina said like there are some very nice seniors as well that are quite willing to like talk to you so um, that's that's how I chose just based on uh, the curriculum and the structure. Um, so my thought process was a bit more complicated. So I did consider going overseas as well. Um, but at the end of the day, I chose to narrow down to Hong Kong because um, of the conversion test. So um, back when I applied, um, there is a there was a conversion test in which um, doctors trained overseas had to go through in order to practice back in Hong Kong. So since I wanted to practice in Hong Kong, I decided to stay in Hong Kong for medical school. So this was the first um, sort of procedure in order to eliminate um, or choose uh, my universities. So as Cherry mentioned, in Hong Kong, there are only two medical schools. So essentially, I just had to choose from HKU or uh, just the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is CUHK. So I ended up choosing um, Hong Kong U, um, also similar to Cherry, because um, I really enjoyed, uh, or I, I foresee that I would enjoy um, the enrichment year. So um, due to the um, uh, freedom that it uh, provides, because um, essentially you just study all the stuff, uh, preclinical stuff in year one and year two, and you get an entire year uh, up to yourself. Whereas for CUHK, um, the, the first three years are preclinical years, um, followed by three years of clinical years. So they do not have that particular enrichment year for you to explore what you want to do. Um, so that was the key reason why I chose Hong Kong U over Chinese University in Hong Kong. So, yeah, so, um, just jumping off what Kyle said, Kyle, I, Kyle, I, I think that like that was a really smart choice, Kyle, like choosing to stay in Hong Kong, because like, um, if you, so if you guys are thinking of like staying and practicing in Hong Kong long term, I think yeah, definitely consider staying like Hong Kong universities because, um, I've heard like the licensing from people who've done the licensing exam that like what ten percent of people pass every year. It is like a really, really difficult exam to do. So if you want to stay, if you see your future in Hong Kong. I would say don't go abroad, but because um, I I 
I've like basically lived in the UK for half my life so I only really considered UK universities and the US was like a myth to me so I didn't even consider that um but in terms of why I chose UCL um so I went to school in London and I wanted to like stay in London for medical school um so it was basically like I picked a UCL and Imperial because um rankings did play a part in like my decision making because I like basically went on QoS and I was like oh Imperial and UCL they're pretty good um so I applied to those but I think I ultimately chose UCL because it's like a more well-rounded university so I don't know if you guys know this but Imperial is just science and business school there isn't there aren't any like English students history students whatever 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 so it's not like as well-rounded I think and also just like just talking to people went to UCL they're all like oh choose UCL it's really really like good for like extracurriculars and there is like a whole program of like extracurriculars you can do and there's a whole separate program for medical students like just there's specific sports teams for medical students specific societies just for medical students so it's really really good for that social aspect and also this is like a thing that I didn't consider because I didn't know about this when I was applying but if you apply to, so if you go to Imperial and do like the end of your exams or whatever, a certain Imperial will fail a certain percentage of people who do the end of your exams because that's just how they work. Whereas at UCL, like everyone can in theory pass a year as long as you like hit the pass mark. So that's like, I think UCL is like a lot safer when it comes to like kind of moving through the years and actually progressing because you know, it was like Imperial will just fail you. Oh my goodness, that's very cutthroat. Um, so uh, Alina, you actually touched on this earlier in the panel, but I'm, I want to revisit it, starting with Cherry though. Um, are there any application processes you need to applying for uh, Hong Kong versus UK med school? Um, I only know about Hong Kong admission things because I only apply to Hong Kong schools. Uh, but one thing that you definitely need to know is that um, if you're OK, I can only speak for the non jupis kids. So kids that did not do the DSE examination. DSE examination is a local examination for Hong Kong. But I'll, since this is a more international panel, I'll just talk about the non jupis applications. So I did. I also did the international baccalaureate. Um, so what you need is you definitely need to have studied chemistry and have uh, hopefully obtained a pretty good um, exam result for chemistry. That is the only compulsory subject for admission to the MBBS program. And you also need to be bilingual, like you, for, for uh, the University of Hong Kong, for HKU, you need to be able to speak and listen to Cantonese. So that facilitates like us when we like work in a hospital. And um, there isn't a fixed cutoff point above which like applicants will be granted interviews or um, admission um, for, for the IB score, because it varies every year. But um, it's, genu it's generally around, um, for uh, the IB examination is around 43. They'll give um, offers. They'll say like, if you get 45, we'll take you in. But if you, um, so that's, that's actually quite um, intense. But if you score something from, I, I know some people that got in from, with uh, 42s for IB. Uh, so from 42 to 45, or just to be safe, 43 to 45, then, um, and also with chemistry and relevant experiences, then, and a good interview performance, obviously, then you should be able to um, get into HKU. Like these are the only requirements. Uh, I think I can uh, supplement a bit on that. So um, Terry mentioned a lot about HKU, so maybe I can talk a bit about the CUHK application process in Hong Kong as well. Um, so I applied to both schools. I applied to HKU and CUHK. So for CUHK, the um, requirements are similar. Um, you're supposed to take chemistry as a compulsory subject. If you're taking um, IB, um, which is um, the curriculum that Terry and I both took. So uh, you have to take chemistry and at a higher level. So if you're choosing standard level and um, higher level, you have to keep this in mind. Um, there are no other subject requirements um, to my knowledge. Um, in terms of the actual submission of your application, you're required to do a personal statement um, for CUHK. Oh, you have, to, you, have, you have to do it for uh, Hong Kong U as well. But the only difference is the word limit. I'm not sure how the word limit works now, but um, you could check it on the um, admission website for sure. Um, so both schools have uh, an interview. So for the University of Hong Kong, the interview is conducted um, in the form of uh, MMI. 
So what that means is there are multiple stations that you have to go through. Um, for example, there will be one station on ethics, one station of on like current issues, one on um, like dexterity, stuff like that. Um, for the Chinese University of Hong Kong, it's more of a chit chat session. So you talk to professors, maybe one student to two professors. Um, so they will ask you questions like, well, why do you want to join our faculty? Why are you interested in medicine? So it's more like a chit chat session for the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, so yeah, you go through these things, you submit your application um, based on your grades, your personal statements. And I think you also need uh, recommendations from um, teachers at your school. Um, this applies to both the University of Hong Kong and the Chinese University of Hong Kong as well. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, you also have to submit a CV for the Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, but that's just, that's a given. So I think that's about it for um, the application processes in Hong Kong. So I did A-levels, um, So, but similar to IB, you had to do chemistry A-level. And I don't know if it's changed now, but some unis require you to do one other science subject, at least, so like chemistry and then biology, for example. And then you need to do the UK CAT and the BMAT. Well, you can you can choose to do like one or the other, but if you want to apply to like the full range of unis, it's a good idea to do both exams. Um, I don't exactly remember what constitutes a good score for the UK CAP. I think when I did it, like 650 was a, out of like, I think 900 was a pretty good score. And then BMAT, like the cutoff really depends on what university you apply to. But um, I know some unis, so UCL did this. Um, after BMAT results day, they would email you with like the mean score of all the BMAT ap applicants. So you could kind of figure out where you stood and if you had a chance to interview. If you were above like the mean, then they, you, you would probably get an interview. And if you're below the mean, you might not get an interview. Um, and then we needed a personal statement, just like for Hong Kong. And um, some this information is something published on the university websites, but some unis focus more on personal statement, other unis focus more on A, predicted A-level grades, other unis focus more on GCSE grades, and some just focus on UK CAT or just focus on BMAT. So it's important to kind of like check the website the university you're applying for. And then when it came to interviews, so uh, UCL and Imperial, the both panel, as far as I know, they might have changed, I'm not sure. Um, but like a lot, so, but for Manchester, it was like an MMI, so, sim so similar to like Hong Kong U, I think it was. Um, but yeah, so just like kind of be prepared to deal with like different interview styles and like a range of different interview questions. So some, so when I did my Queen Mary interview, I got sent like a newspaper article beforehand that I had to read and then like, discuss in the interview and then whereas you see I was just a panel of four doctors asking me stuff so yeah just like kind of read into it I suppose um and and tying into this question Cherry can you detail any experiences that you think are unique to studying medicine in Hong Kong uh, and then for Alina yes and also in the UK I think actually studying medicine in whatever country, like you'll learn things that are unique to the uh, country or the city that you're in. Like for HKU, uh, we actually study traditional Chinese medicine as well, just as a small module. Um, it's a bit difficult, but it's actually quite interesting. You get to learn about a whole, whole different culture and their approach to uh, medicine and the integration of tra traditional Chinese medicine with the Western medicine that um, that. Um, constitutes a bachelor of medicine and bachelor of surgery. And I think that's quite interesting. And we also, we, we do something uh, known as PBL. And um, many of the cases, I think PBL is also, I'm not sure if it's done in, I think it's done in some UK uh, uh, medical schools too, but um, a lot of the cases are quite unique to Hong Kong. Um, it's, it's quite, um, uh, it integrates a lot of the medicine that we learn to the local culture. So it helps us sort of be able to visualize these uh, symptoms, these diseases in more of a, a Hong Kong based context. So I think that's one thing that's unique, maybe the traditional Chinese medicine course. I, I'm not sure if this is offered in uh, the UK or, but, but, but yeah, that's, I think that's the unique point. Yeah. Um, when I, when I, when I was told that I had to uh, do a traditional Chinese medicine course um, in year one, I was really, really confused. Um, because we weren't told about this during the admission process. Uh, like no one told us anything about like a traditional Chinese medicine module. So 
um, cause our degree is a Western medicine um, degree uh, on, on surgery and medicine. So it was really confusing as to why we had to do that. But um, it is actually quite interesting in a sense that you get to understand um, local customs and traditional ways of dealing with healthcare. Um, so that actually really changed my perspective on medicine quite a bit. So originally I just thought, oh, I'll just give medicine, do surgery, that, that's, that's it. But um, it sort of informs you that when you're actually practicing medicine, you also have to think and care for um, the, the, what the cultures and what people locally in the region may think or perceive about medicine. So if you don't think from their point of view, it's really hard for them to accept what you're actually going to give them. So um, on one hand, you can synthesize um, local customs with the medicine or the treatments that you're learning or researching. So for example, you may be researching about like really, really weird drugs and stuff like that, that the locals may not understand at all. So um, if you have a better understanding of um, different ways of approaching healthcare in the city that you're going to serve, then it's going to give you a better perspective of how to become a better doctor. So this is one thing that I think is really unique to um, HKU. Um, another thing that I find interesting, um, this may apply to all the universities, um, all, all medical schools in the world, is that um, the, the school that you're in will teach you knowledge that is very specific um, to your population in terms of the disease epidemiology. So for example, um, you may place uh, more emphasis, we, we place more heavy emphasis on diseases, for example, like nasopharyngeal cancer, because um, this is more um, um, prevalent in um, our communities, uh, the Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian communities. Whereas I'm not sure about the UK, but they may not um, talk about this. Yeah, they, yeah. so it's not an emphasis uh, in Western countries because these sort of diseases are not um, prevalent over there. So when you choose your universities, it's also a good thing to uh, keep in mind uh, what are the populations you want to serve in the future, because your education um, from these university will differ quite significantly in, in this aspect. So I didn't really notice this in Brooklyn because it wasn't in the hospitals, I was just doing lectures, but um, London is like a really multicultural melting pot there's people from literally every country in london um which um is really 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 cool but then at the same time you will come across patients on your clinical placements who don't speak a lick of english like no english whatsoever um and then you're still gonna have to assess them because they're a patient they need help you need to help them um so it's kind of, it's a kind of like a different experience com compared to just like going and I'm speaking English or like if it's a Chinese patient, you can speak Chinese. Um, like if you don't speak that language and the patient doesn't speak your language, it's um, it can be really, really difficult to communicate, but it's also, also really, really important. So you kind of have to, in that sense, like develop your nonverbal communication skills really, really well, or like try and use like stuff like Google Translate and stuff like that. Cause not, cause like not every hospital will have like untranslated all hours of the day. So you kind of have to, do it on your own a lot of the time and I think that's like a really really useful skill to have because I'm not sure about like Hong Kong but like when I used to live there everyone kind of either spoke Chinese Mandarin or English so um there's less of kind of like a language barrier there but like it definitely is like a thing in London and most of the UK city so you do have to like kind of learn and practice your non-verbal communication skills so that they're really really good because you will come across patients like probably every week who don't speak English. Mm, yeah, uh, I, I think the traditional Chinese medicine really got me there. <laughs> I think my grandma will be happy to hear that. <laughs> uh, Cherry, do you have any tips for students who are stressed out right now with applying to medicine, uh, medical school? Okay, I think what for, I'll just explain what I sort of did. Like I uh, had a spreadsheet um, and I put on the um, further end, like this name of the school the requirements, what they require you to do, like just some admission things. And then after that, I just um, focused on school. I focused on my, um, focus on, okay, I focus on the grades. I focus on rele relevant experiences, like maybe doing some charity work so, or, or even some research, just gathering things that you can talk about in your medical school interview. 
But at the same time, I was also trying to read more medical books or, or stories about uh, doctors and stuff like that to, to see if this was something that I really wanted to um, study. I also watched a bit of Grey's Anatomy, which I agree is not incredibly accurate, but um, I guess that sort of inspired me too. But I just want to say like to any um, people that might be applying for, to medicine, um, I know it might seem daunting because like like just seeing the PGs for Hong Kong, you need a you need to have a 44, 45 PG, you need a score above 42, 43. Like these are these are like quite scary, quite scary things. So honestly, um, you guys need to know that it isn't the end of the world if you don't get a score high enough to get into medicine. It's it doesn't mean that you won't get into medicine. Um, I have a friend who didn't actually get a score, uh, like I think scored two to three marks below the minimum requirement. But um, what he did was he decided to study um, bachelor's, uh, I think for public health. And also someone else like, yeah, did public health or did global health and development. These courses, if you score very well on it and you express your interest in studying medicine um, to, to relevant professors, they will consider you and they will take you in. Like I've known people that have gone to, uh, through this route of medicine. So I think no matter, um, what score you get, there will be a route to get you into a medical school if your passion is there, if you really, really, really want to get into a medical school. It's always possible. Um, just, yeah, don't lose hope, even if you don't get the scores or whatever. Just have a good plan and just uh, keep trying. And yeah. Right. Um, for me, uh, I would say that um, the most important thing if you're planning to apply to Hong Kong um, medical schools is in fact your grades. Um, this, is, uh, this is a fact because if you don't reach their minimum requirements, um, they probably won't offer you an interview. So the number one most important thing is your grades. But at the same time, I, I fully agree with Cherry that uh, the grades um, does not you're, you're like no matter how well you do in school or how badly you do in school, it, it doesn't mean you cannot get into medicine at all. Um, as long as you are really passionate about medicine, you have the relevant experiences. For example, if you read a lot of medicine related books, you do a lot of services, you do a lot of attachments. Even if you don't get to the medical school of your first choice on your first try, you will eventually be able to end up in medical schools, um, even if it's not in Hong Kong. So I have a friend who missed the grade by like one mark or two. Um, so um, he ended up going to um, Australia to study medicine. So um, there are always a lot of options for you to consider as long as you keep your mind open and have a list of backups. This to me was the most important thing um, when I was applying for university. So I had an entire list of um, the schools that I would apply and would consider um, from one uh, to whatever the number was um, all the way down. So if the first one didn't work, I would go to the second one. If it didn't work, I would go to the third one. So as long as you have a plan, um, just focus on your studies, focus on your relevant experiences. Even if you don't get into number one or two or three, you'll still end up somewhere that you enjoy eventually. So there's no need to be too stressed about it. So I guess the UK is slightly different in this sense because grades are not... I guess the most important thing that they look for because there are medical schools who will, will take you in with a b at a level which is not very high um but i think what's really really important if you want to apply to medical school in the uk is have your mo like have like your motivations really really clear in your head so when someone asks you the question why do you want to do medicine don't just say to help people because <laughs> that's not a great answer um so i'd say like actually fully do your research read read all the books do your work experience do your volunteering help like vulnerable people help like volunteer with the elderly volunteer with children volunteer with people with like learning dis difficult difficulties with special needs just like make sure you kind of like have a clear idea of why you want to do medicine not just oh because my parents want me to do it or because oh all my friends are doing it or oh I want to help people like have like a really really clear like motivation and desire to study medicine and like if you read if like you really really truly want to become a doctor and study medicine just to, like to study medicine just to be a doctor not for like um like the prestige or like the money or whatever like that will come through in your interview and that is like what a lot of like in panelists at UK universities are looking for on top of like vaguely like good grades like the motivation is also also really really important 
and you need to be able to back that up with your own personal experiences in interview as well. Oh, okay, so I mean, I, I really enjoy hearing all of your guys' stories and motivations leading into this stuff. Um, Cherry, would you, I know you mentioned clinical internship that you did in high school. And so for, for everybody else, and maybe Cherry, have you anything else to add to that? Are there things that you could advise some of our audience about things that you can do in high school, like specific things that to prepare you for med school in that sense? Um, I think for, for our school, we have we have something called CAS. I, oh, I think Kyle already talked about it. Creativity, action, and service. I think one thing that you can do the most is um, explore if you truly enjoy helping people. Because I think just to gather a lot of surface experiences, like helping uh, elderly, as, as uh, Alina said, people with learning, uh, learning difficulties, um, um, things like that. Like, don't just do it for the CV. Like, I think um, through through high school, they give you, like in high school, there's a lot of chances to actually do service. Like see if actually service is something that you enjoy, something that you're passionate about. So um, I try to join a lot of different like elderly care home things to see if I actually enjoy interacting with people like that. Um, I think that's that's a good, good place to start. Um, I think also with a clinical internship thing, like uh, it might sound really difficult to reach out to like surgeons and stuff like that. But I think for me, I guess I was just, I just decided to give it a try to email a bunch of neurosurgeons, email a bunch of surgeons. And I, I was, I was lucky enough for one of the surgeons to be like, oh yeah, sure. Just join me for a week. And then I actually learned a lot from that. I got to go um, witness, like I got to go into the operating theater as, as a 15 year old and watch a lot of surgeries. Like it was, it was one of the coolest experiences of my life. So I think just be brave, be open-minded and don't be afraid to ask people for help or ask people questions or just try to reach out to people. Cause, um, and don't be afraid of getting rejected. I probably reached out to like 20, 30 people and only got responses from one person, but it was worth it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um... More practically speaking, I would say um, if you're really worried that you cannot get a response from any um, one that you email, there are actually programs you can apply for as a high school student. So you can apply for um, local hospital attachments. So they're like these hospitals would actually put um, these programs on their websites. So you can actually check um, if any of those suit you. Um, so you can attach for like, let's say two weeks at a ho local hospital, um, or you can join like summer programs. So for example, the Chinese University of Hong Kong offers something called a SCAP program. So it's like a summer clinical attachment thing um, that you can do at the university. Um, I think there are also a lot of other summer programs in um, Hong Kong U. They offer like summer broadening programs. Um, which introduced you to the field of medicine. So these are things that you can join as a high school student on top of um, attaching to specific doctors. Um, if you are worried that you do not have enough experience on top of the stuff that we mentioned, um, personally, you can just go to read more medical related books. You can do more services. But at the end of the day, if you're applying for a Hong Kong medical schools, once again, um, the grades are the most important thing. So you would probably not want to waste a lot of your time on these kind of stuff um, when you want to focus more on your academics. But at the end of the day, it, this scheduling and stuff is really up to you. So I would kind of say like, just stay on top of your academics at school. Like make sure you're not like failing and you can actually like meet the grade requirements that the uni has given you or like you've seen like posted on the uni website and in terms of kind of like work experience I basically did what Cherry did I emailed a bunch of doctors I emailed doctors that used to like care for me um and yeah I got a response of like one or two <laughs> but um yeah I think that that method does work but just be prepared to like wait and to be rejected because it happens it happens throughout medical school it will happen throughout your medical career like it will happen um and then in terms of kind of like if you want to do like a specific program i know in london um ucl does like a healthcare program for high school students and then in hong kong i think there's like i think hong kong u does a 
work experience program at Queen Mary, I think. I can't remember because I did it for a bit, but I don't remember the name, but it definitely exists. Um, and yeah, um, just kind of like make sure that you have like a good idea of what medicine is like, not just from watching house, because that's not it. Um, but yeah, do some work experience, make sure your grades are kind of like up to scratch and yeah, you, you'll be absolutely fine. Okay, um, we're reaching the end of our panel now. We have five minutes left. And before, before we say goodbye to our wonderful panelists, I just wanna, I have one last question for you guys. Um, what is the one thing you wish that you had done differently in high school to prepare you better for your time in university? Starting with Cherry. <laughs> okay, uh, this is quite a difficult question, but I think, um, I wish I did a little bit more research into the different universities, because I think, I was just way too focused on applying for the medical program and I never looked at the universities holistically. I only focused on the medical program, which is not good because um, I think to apply to every single university, you should at least get a holistic understanding of what the school culture is like and all of that. Like I, I didn't really know what CUHK or HKU was like at all. I just knew it had medicine. So I went for it. Like, I don't recommend that at all. Like you should also try to do a bit of research and background and history of the school, maybe apply to certain halls and stuff like that. Like just so you have more of a student life. Like, I think I regret that. And I also wish I had, um, maybe reached out to more seniors because um as I said or like reach out to people that are already in medical school or in the medical schools that you want to be in because I, I I find that actually to be one of the most helpful like ways to get get information about medical schools and um we're all very happy to help you guys like so uh yeah so I think just don't be afraid to reach out to people um so for me I think um, if I were in high school again, um, I would um, stress less on my academics. So I, I mentioned a lot of the, a lot. I mentioned quite a few times that academics is the most important factor to get to medical school in Hong Kong. But um, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't mean everything. So if I were to go through high school again. I would tell myself to relax a bit more, do more of the stuff that I enjoy um, instead of like stressing too much about academics. It is important, it is important, but at the end of the day, um, it doesn't, it really doesn't mean um, anything. So just try to enjoy your high school life a bit more. Don't be too stressed about university applications. And if you are really set on medicine, um, like Terry mentioned, do reach out to seniors because back in high school, I reached out to quite a few of my seniors and they provided really, really good insights um, as to what to expect from medical school and in, and things like the culture um, in the school or like um, any weird things that would happen, stuff like that. So these are like more personal um, experiences that you can get from um, talking to seniors. And these are probably the most valuable things that you can get out of a high school. Uh, scenario. Yeah, I think what I would do is not like cry about my grades every day. I didn't do that, but it like I was really, really stressed about my grades. And at the end of the day, like I'm in fifth year now. What I got A level, what I got at GCC doesn't matter at all. What I got UK cat B mat, like in the grand scheme of things, even if you get like a lower UK cat score or a lower B mat score, it's not the end of the world. Um, but like. Also, like, yeah, just jump, just like what Cherry and um, Kyle said, if you really want to like know more about what it's like to study medicine, like mess just message like, your seniors. Like I get people messaging me on like Facebook or LinkedIn being like, oh, I want to study medicine. I've done this. Can you help me look up over one personal statement? And like, I'm really happy to do that, to do that for people. And I know like a lot of my like course mates are also really happy to like help younger, younger years, like get into medical school. So yeah, don't be afraid to just like ask because you never know like what you might get in return. Okay, thank you so much to Cherry and Kyle and Elena for joining us today. Um, I hope that everybody learned as much as I did today. 
I mean, I'm a business student, so this is totally left field for me, but everything was so great. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody wants to contact any of our panelists directly, please contact Millie through Instagram or our other social media, and we'll be sure to connect you through their LinkedIn and their other socials. And if you want to keep up with what Millie also has to offer and our other panels that we have going on, please be sure to check out our website at milliegroup.com and follow us on Instagram at millie underscore group for more updates. Thanks so much, guys, and um, I'll see you. Bye.